Now we want to talk about uh, two algorithms to do clipping, but not with triangles, but with arbitrary polygons, because that's something that uh, sometimes we uh, we also need, or it's very uh, convenient. Uh, of course, we can always split a polygon into single triangles, but uh, if this is not uh, efficient enough, then of course we can. Uh, there are also ways to do this directly with the polygon. And these are two algorithms that are not mentioned in the book, but they are important uh, algorithms or uh, interesting algorithms in, in graphics, which is why I will cover them. Uh, the slides should be enough to understand them. If not, if you want more information, just Google them. There is a lot of information online or to look it up in one of the other graphics books uh, that contain them. So there is a lot of information about this online. Also, I will only explain it in 2D because, yeah, that is much easier to draw and much easier to explain. But the generalization to 3D is straightforward, but I will not cover that. I will just uh, talk about the 2D case. So what we have is we have a clipping area. And if you have a 2D case, of course, this is just uh, in this case, a square uh, rectangle. And uh, if we uh, then we have an arbitrary polygon, for example, this blue shaped, uh, uh, blue shaped, this blue colored shape here. And uh, the first algorithm we're talking about is called the so is the so called Sutherland Hodgman algorithm, which is I mean, the, the, the most straightforward thing that you would probably do that we also did with the triangles, if you, you uh, clip the polygon by clipping it against every hyperplane that defines the border of this uh, clipping area. And uh, so, for example, if we start here at the top, we take this hyperplane, or in, in 2D it's a line, that defines the upper side of our clipping area. And then we see, get these intersection points here, this one and this one, and then we cut it off here. And then we take the second one and then we get this intersection point here and another intersection point here and we cut it off here and then we test against the other two planes and in this example so we see that there there are no intersection points so we know we are done and this is now the dark blue color is now our new polygon so that is of course pretty simple and pretty straightforward steps but uh, of course the question is how do we we have to formalize this and phrase this into a, an algorithm so this is a the pseudocode description of this algorithm so let's just go go through it to see it so um, we start by extending one side in this case the upper side of the rectangle across the 2d space so uh, the rectangle is our few frustum or our clipping area. We extend this, so we have a hyperplane here, which if we have the rectangle here, of course, we also have the vertices, and then we can use them to just specify this line or to uh, formalize the line. And then we start walking around the polygon from a start vertex, let's say, for example, at P0. We start at one vertex and follow the polygon and until we are back at the starting vertex. So we start here, walk around here until we are back at the start. And while we are doing this, we create a new vertex every time we cross the clipping line. So in this first case, we create a new vertex here and here. And then we create a new, when we're back at the start, we create a new polygon by uh, using these vertices and throwing away this one here, these two here. So uh, if we go here, we have P0, then we go to the next, we get the intersection point I0, then P1, then P2, then uh, let's call this I, I don't know, dash, I dash, I call it I dash because in the next step it will disappear. Then we have P3 and so on. And then we know, okay, these are, this is the first one where we, when we start inside, this is where we exit, and this is where we enter again. So we know we can remove these two here from our polygon, and this is then our new polygon here. And then in the next step, we repeat this for the next clipping line. Again, we walk across the border of the polygon, but now our new polygon. So we walk from P0 to I1 to I dash. Well, then we cross here a clipping line, so we create a new entry here, which is I1, and then we come to I dash, P3 again, and so on, and then we get another entry I2, and then, of course, we cut that off, and then we have this here, and for the next two, nothing happens. So we see this is pretty straightforward, and this is also very easy to formalize and to, to calculate. 
and um, but there is one problem with this which is that if we have a polygon like this we get a degenerated result because the result will not be these two polygons but the result will be a polygon one polygon that has this part here included and that is of course not what we want so this algorithm works well in a lot of situations but in this particular case it will not produce a correct result and this is why we have the second algorithm here which is called the Weiler Atherton algorithm which is a little more complicated but always produces correct result and the basic idea of that algorithm is that we create a graph based on the polygon and the clipping area and then we enter uh, where the nodes represent the, uh, the, the vertices of the polygon and the clipping area and the intersection points and then we enter edges into that graph which can be very entered very easily based on the, the, the shapes and but we enter them in a way that makes us uh, makes it very easy to extract the new the clipped polygons from it so let's go through this uh, algorithm step by step and I will see that it is actually quite easy so uh, <clears throat> To build this graph, we start by first creating the nodes of the graph or the vertices. So this is the part where we create the vertices and it says we create for each polygon vertice, we have a node in the graph. For each clipping region vertice, we have a node in the graph. And for each intersection vertice, we have a node in the graph. So you see here, polygon from P0 to P8 gives our nodes here. Intersections, we have four from I0 to I3 gives our nodes here. And for the clipping region, we have four corners, so we have four, uh, four uh, vertices and four nodes in our graph here. Now we enter the edges, which are these two steps. First, we enter the, action, the edges by walking along the boundary of the polygon and include the intersection vertices when we come across one. So we start by walking along the borders of the polygon. Let's start at P0. From P0 we go to P1, but we include the intersection vertices. So we see the first node uh, we, we get is an intersection. So we make an edge from here to the intersection. The next one is P1. From P1 we continue, we meet P2. From P2 we come to P3. From P3 we come to I3. From I3 we come to P4. From P4 to P5. From P5 to I2 from I2 to uh, P6, from P6 to P7, to P8, and then we come to I1, and then we are back again at uh, here, where we started, P0. Now in the second step, we uh, insert the edges by walking along the boundary of the clipping region, again, including the intersection vertices. So we start, for example, at R0, then we come to R1, from R1, we come to the first intersection, I0. Then we come to I1, which is down here. From I1, we come to R2. From R2, we come to I2. From I2, we come to I3. From I3, we go to R3. And from R3, we go again to R0. And then we're done. But you, so you see that was pretty simple. We just walked around the border of the polygon or the clipping region. The uh, only thing I skipped here was this sentence here. In case of the polygon, we distinguish between outgoing and incoming intersections, which I did here by using a different color. So if we walk here in this direction, I0 is an outgoing in, uh, uh, node. Whereas if we come back here, I3 is an incoming node because we're going inside of the clipping region again. So I gave it a different color. Same for I2 and I1. And the reason why we need this is because if we can distinguish between incoming and outcoming, then we can very easily get these polygons based on this graph. And that is done by this algorithm here. We start at an outgoing intersection vertex that is one of the red vertices here in the image. Yeah. You have to check that first. Yeah, that you, you need to know that. If you just choose a random one, you have to do a check if it is inside or outside. Yeah. Good. 
And yeah, so if you know that, then you can specify the incoming and outcoming vertices. And then <coughs> you start at an outgoing intersection vertex. So for example, at I0. And then you walk along the boundary of the clipping region. So the black edges in the images. So here you walk, oops, <laughs> to I1. along the border of the clipping region until you reach an incoming intersection vertex, which in this case is I0. And then you switch from not walking along the clipping region, but to walk along the boundary of the polygon. So the red, oops, sorry, <laughs> the red lines in the image. So from I0, we walk to P0 and we continue doing that, continue, until we reach the starting vertex again, which, ah, sorry, which is already the next step. And then we see here we have I0, I1, P0, I0, and that is of course our first polygon here. Then we do this again with the next unvisited outgoing intersection vertex. In this case, we only have two. So we only have to do it with the second one, I0, uh, I2. And again, if you follow, why am I switching always wrong here? Here, uh, if we follow the lines, we get I3, P4, P5, and I2, which is our second polygon. So you see very simple and very easily, you can get the polygons from the, uh, from the graph. This is also a very uh, thankful uh, topic for people in the exam, in the final exam. Uh, I think Peter probably made a, a comment about this last time that uh, like there are a lot of people who did very badly in the first exam. Um, it is actually, so uh, what I want to say is I want to encourage you don't give up because uh, it is not that uncommon that people do better in the second part. First of all, this mathematics you should get more familiar with it over time. So you're doing better with that, improve with that, hopefully. Uh, and also in the second exam, since it is not pure mathematics, but a lot more the graphics algorithms, there's a lot of stuff that people who are bad at mathematics still can do quite well. And this is, for example, something you just need to learn the algorithm and then you can, can do it. But I want the reason why I'm coming up with this now is that I also want to warn you, don't just learn the algorithm and try to memorize it, but also try to understand why we are doing it and how we are doing it and why we need it. Because it is, for example, a very common mistake. I always see this in the exams that people forgot that the, the question is draw a graph with a, a create a graph from the Weiler Atherton algorithm and the people draw an undirected graph. So they don't include the arrows in the, in the edges, which doesn't make sense because you cannot use it then to create the polygons. You need the directions to create the polygons and uh, the clipped polygons. So learn the algorithms, but also try always to understand why we're doing it in that way, because that can then later avoid making stupid mistakes that cost you points and credits in your exam, uh, although you basically know how to do it. Good. All right. Uh, one thing is here, I uh, kind of skipped over this part here when we switch from the polygon to uh, from walking along the clipping region to walking along the polygon, it says here continue and then I switch to until we reach the starting vertex and I skip this part here saying changing from polygon boundary to clipping region and the other way around until we reach the starting vertex. So this is of course a very simple example to explain the algorithm but there are a little more complex situations so for example um, where do I draw this here? Maybe you can probably draw it here. Or let's do it here. If you have a triangle like this, and let's say this is the outgoing and this is the incoming vertex, incoming and this is... Uh, <sighs> People always complain that about my graphics tool in the evaluation, but no one never recommends me a better one. So if you know a better one, let me know. Um, the, uh, yeah, in this case, we see that if you follow the algorithm in this way, then it's not just this one circle that you do, but you have to switch between walking along 
the polygon and walking along the clipping region. So you walk along the poly, uh, the clip start by walking along the poly, uh, the clipping region, then the polygon, then the clipping region, then the polygon, then the clipping region, and then the polygon again until you reach the start vertex. Which is why we have this sentence in here that we have to switch between this. So this is if we implemented actually a loop until we reach then the starting vertex. Good. <clears throat> so we see that uh, these are two simple algorithms to clip uh, polygons. So we know now how to clip triangles, how to clip <coughs> arbitrary polygons. But we have not talked yet about the case that we have also in the practicals, which is the culling of triangles. How do we remove triangles that are completely outside of the view frustum? You have a question? Um, if it is fully outside of the view frustum, you don't use it because you start inside of it. So you can already, well, basically, you if it's fully outside or fully inside, you you do not use it in the first place because uh, you identify those cases before. Outside is exactly what we are going to do now because of the culling. And if it is inside, uh, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, it, it depends on. Uh, you can you can apply it if it's inside, but then you get a graph that is has no intersections, and then the polygon is just uh, you you by applying the algorithm you realize that it's completely inside. Yeah, but you would in practice not use it. You would do a test first, which are the polygons that are intersecting, because like uh, someone here asked, uh, you also have to know is the starting point inside or outside of the polygon, so you have to do a pre-test. Good. So these are all the kind of things, if you really implement it, of course, you have to think about all these special cases and these, these situations. I'm often here just explaining the basic concepts. Like I said at the beginning, the, the lecture is more on the theory, the concepts behind it. If you implement it, then you run into all these kind of special cases that you have to consider, of course. Good. All right. Yeah, so culling now. Um, yeah, we could, of course, integrate that in the clipping by saying we, we integrate in our clipping, reach, uh, clipping algorithms and then we just clip the triangles completely. Uh, but of course, that would be very inefficient. Um, it, uh, it would be more efficient if we can remove triangles completely. Also, if you think about if you have, for example, a game with a game character, like, uh, I don't know, a, a dinosaur, and that model is made of uh, hundreds or even thousands of triangles, then of course checking each triangle if it is inside or outside is very inefficient. It would be much more efficient if we could say, well, this is the whole character. Let's check, do a first check, is the whole character intersecting or inside of the view frustum or is the whole character completely outside with one test then we don't have to do the test with all the hundred individual triangles and this is usually done by using so-called bounding volume so if we have for example a, a model of a character we make a bounding volume around it and then we check if if this bounding volume contains the character completely or the model completely then we can check if this bounding volume intersects with the view frustum there is a chance that the character also intersects, but if it doesn't inter intersect, we can be sure that the character, that all the triangles that make up this, this model do not intersect with the view frustum. So we don't have to do these hundreds of tests with all the individual triangles. So this can improve the performance, and this is called the culling bounding volumes approach. And it says here this is a conser conservative test. I basically already answered why this is a conservative test, because of this situation here because we can say um, <clears throat> if if we make a bounding volume around the, uh, the the model that contains it completely and then we check against the view frustum we can be sure that if it is outside this this view, volume is outside of the view frustum that all the triangles within are outside of the view frustum but if it intersects it could also be that it intersects at one part of the view volume where there is actually no triangle inside so then we do we do uh, <coughs> tests that are not really necessary but we guarantee that we do not lose uh, uh, run into a situation where we accidentally clip something that interacts uh, that intersects which is why this is called a conservative test Yeah, then you have another special case where you have to be careful. Um, I mean, uh, yeah, like uh, like I said, this, this, these are all these kind of uh, special cases that you need to check. And uh, in general, this uh, this leads to directly to the next question. Of course, what is the optimum bounding volume? Because if you make the bounding volume very large, 
or or no the the most uh the least unnecessary tests you get of course the closer the bounding volume is to the to the to the actual to the actual model so if you have this here for example unfortunately i have it in red now so let's say if this is your model and you have a bounding volume like this you will of course have much less unnecessary tests than if you make a bounding model like this for example in this test you would not get a test with this here but you would get a test with this here. So making the bounding volume closer to the actual model makes unnecessary tests less likely. But of course, the more closer you make it to the model, the more complicated the test gets. So there is a trade-off between what kind of volume do you use to make the tests simpler and what kind of volume do you use to make it match the model better. And in practice, this is why in practice very often so bounding spheres, spheres are used as bounding volumes. Although with a sphere, if you think about a dinosaur, if you make a, a sphere around it, you have a lot of empty space there. You will end up doing a, a lot of uh, unnecessary tests. But these tests, the test that you do with the sphere itself is very simple. It's very, uh, very easy to calculate because um, you just need to verify this condition here. If we have a plane that is defined by an implicit equation by a normal vector and a point P on the plane uh, A and uh, a, s a sphere that is defined by its center and its radius then we can say that if it fulfills this condition then the sphere is outside of the view frustum. And we see this, uh, if we look at the, uh, if we remember what we had at the very beginning, when we talked about um, about the, uh, the, the vectors and the scalar product, and also we talked about the projection of a vector onto another. So if we look at here, the, uh, remember the projection of a vector V onto another, that was the distance here, the length of this, if we project it down here onto another vector, then the length of this is the projection PV. So it's not a vector, this is a scalar, this is the length of this distance when we project it in this direction, when we have this angle phi here, and then we proved that we can calculate this by taking the length of the vector V times the cosine of the angle between the two vectors. Now, if you take this condition here and then do the scalar product in the first case then you see that the length of n is getting removed so we just have the cosine of the length of c minus a which is of course the projection the length of the projection of the vector c minus a onto the normal vector if phi is the angle between the normal vector and c minus a now if you look at the image here then you see of course that this projection here because this is the projection, this is P C minus A, and because we have two right angles here, you see that this is actually the same length here. Now, if you look at, if you think about the image, this is the plane, this is the center of the of the of the sphere, and that means if this is the center of the sphere, and this is the radius of the sphere. And if this is the plane, and we see if this uh, distance here is larger than the radius, of course the sphere is outside of the, does not intersect with the plane. But if it is smaller, then it does intersect with the plane. So this is why we can just say if this is larger than r, then we uh, we have an easy test to see if the sphere intersects with the plane. Now the uh, of course, here we have the, the cosine between the angles, but that's why we write it that way, because then we can just calculate the scalar product by multiplying and adding up the, the coefficients, so we don't need to do a complex uh, trigonometric uh, calculation with the angle. So we can check this very easy condition to check for the intersection with the sphere. Good. So this is called the uh, frustum culling. In the book, there are three other cases listed. One uh, culling, one is also the occlusion culling, which means if an object is occluded by another one, 
So if we have a camera here or our eye is here and we're looking in that direction and this object cannot be seen because it's occluded by the other one, then we could also do a culling here. But I will not cover this and also in the book it's actually it's mentioned at the beginning but it's not uh, covered in detail. Mm. But we will talk about back, uh, a hidden surface removal later, which is uh, some sort of it. But we will not here really talk about the, the occlusion culling. But we will talk about the back face culling, which is actually uh, one of the most important forms of culling in graphics, especially in relation to, to games. Because um, and that is the kind of culling that you do if you have a closed object, like a, a game character, for example, where you cannot look inside of it, like other than, for example, a glass, where you can also look inside of the glass. But if it has, a, if you have a closed model, like a dinosaur, um, then uh, <laughs> then uh, <clears throat> you cannot see, of course, the backside of it. So if you just look at the front, then you don't see the backside of it. So you don't need to draw all the triangles that are in the back so you can do a culling with them and remove them before you do the actual calculation. You just need to know what these triangles are that are to the back of it. And um, so, uh, or yeah, a, a simple example that illustrates how we can really save a lot of processing time here is if we just look at a cube, we see a cube has eight, uh, six sides, which means uh, if we model each side with a triangle, we have 12 triangles. But if we look at it, no matter from which perspective we look, we see at maximum three sides. We can see one side, we can see two sides or three sides, but we can never see four or more sides of the cube, which means the maximum number that of triangles that we see is always six. So even with a very simple model, we get already 50% reduction in our uh, processing by just removing the, the back-facing uh, triangles. So you can imagine if you have a more complex model like a dinosaur, you get uh, get a lot of saving in your calculation. Now the question is, of course, how do we specify those back facing uh, uh, back facing um, triangles? And uh, we actually already talked about this, how to do that in a different context today. If you remember how we checked that a triangle, if a triangle intersects with the frustum before uh, to do a clipping, we said if we just need to, to enter the point in the plane equation and if it is below zero or larger than zero then we know it is on the positive or on the negative side. So if we make the convention that we also did then that the normals always point to the outside which is actually a straightforward convention for modeling because uh, you also need the normals for shading calcul for calculation of the of the shading and of course if it is a closed model then uh, you only have the light on the outside so you have the vectors pointing to the outside anyhow but then the triangle can be represented with an implicit equation and you have an i position which is represented by a vector so you just have to enter the i position if this is your your plane equation f of p then you just have to enter the i vector into your plane equation and check if it is larger zero or smaller zero and then you know it is on the positive or on the negative side of the plane that means it is a front facing or back facing plane triangle and that means you can either cut it off or you have to draw it and this is by the way also the reason why in, in sometimes in games if you have this mistake when you come very close to a character and you kind of walking into it it suddenly disappears and that is because they're not modeling the inside of course of the character because normally you cannot walk inside of another person but if you if the, the program accidentally does it then suddenly you have this effect that parts of the model are suddenly disappearing that is exactly then the situation that you're looking at a face from the back which is then of course not modeled and not drawn because you do the culling first because it would also not make sense to draw the inside of a person of course good um, yeah, so you see, we can do a very simple test with that, and then we can eliminate the back-facing back uh, uh, triangles and do the culling, so we save a lot of processing time. Um, but there is, um, and, and of course we also do not only save, save the processing time in terms of that we do not need to draw it, but we also don't need to specify the order, because we have of course a problem if we have two triangles that are 
in front of each other from my perspective, then of course we only want to draw the frontmost triangle because otherwise we would get of course a, a wrong image. And this is exactly the situation that we have here. If we draw this image, we have to make sure that the yellow triangles are drawn in front of the blue triangles and that the green triangles are drawn in front of the yellow triangles. And this is done with an approach that is called the hidden surface removal, or which uh, this, no, this uh, approaches to do this are usually this, uh, named as hidden surface removal. And one of the approaches, the simplest approach, is the so-called painter's algorithm, where we basically just draw the triangles from the back to the front. So we draw, in this case, the blue one first, then we draw the yellow ones, then we draw the green ones. And of course, if we do this in the right order, we are sure that in the end we have the right image uh, that the, the triangles that are closest to us are really then the ones that we see and the ones that are partly hidden are then indeed partly hidden in our image. Now, the problem with this is, of course, first of all, we need to create uh, an order of their set value. The objects need to be sorted by some set value, which is computationally expensive, especially if you have models with hundreds or thousands of triangles. But also we have situations like this here where we have them arranged in a way that we cannot do a unique ordering, a unique back to front ordering. And also, of course, the triangles could with the models intersect. And then, of course, we can also not specify a clear order. We could, of course, in these two cases, split the triangles in individual ones. So we could, for example, say, OK, we, we create here from these two triangles a couple of new ones, or here, and then this two here, and this here. But that would make it even less, even more computationally expensive. So we have to find a different way to deal with this. And uh, one of the most, or the most common used approach in graphics is the so-called set buffer, which is also supported by hardware and uh, used uh, by, by most games, but there are also software implementations of it. So for example, if you do a movie and you do a pre-rendering, you don't need real time, then you sometimes use a, a software implementation of it, but most of the, the hardware also supports it. And the idea of the set buffer is actually very simple. It is, uh, basically just keeping another buffer that has the same size as the screen or as our frame buffer and storing information about the depth of the objects in that buffer. So basically storing the set value in this buffer for each individual pixel. And based on that, and then we use that information to draw the triangles appropriately. That is to only draw the triangles that are the closest to us. So the way this works, is really straight, uh, pretty, really extremely simple. We initialize first the set buffer with the maximum set value that we have, which is, of course, the value of the far plane, because that is the furthest object that we can draw. So we initialize it with the far plane or one value behind the far plane. And then we say, if we draw a pixel at a specific position, ij, we look at the value in the set buffer. If that set buffer is indeed this maximum value, we know, okay, there has no pixel drawn there before, so we can just draw the object there. If there is already a value in there, then we know, okay, there has already been an object drawn at this pixel. Then we compare the set value with the set value of the object. And then we say, if the set value is close, smaller, then it means the object is closer to us or larger, depending if you look in a positive or net negative set direction. Um, but you get the idea. We compare the values. If we say it is closer, then we draw the object and store the new set value of that object in the set buffer. If it is behind the one that we have already drawn, that we have in the set buffer, then we do not draw it because we know it's behind it, so we cannot see it. So we just ignore it. And that way, in the end, we know that when we have drawn all the objects, we have only drawn the objects that are the closest to us, or if we have at some point drawn one that is behind another object, we overdraw draw it then later with the one that is closer to it, because we always check before we draw something if there is something in the set buffer and if it is behind or in front of the object that we are planning to draw now. So this is uh, um, pretty uh, simple, uh, simple algorithm. And of course, we do this for the vertices. But for example, here in this case, where we have overlapping triangles, we also, of course, do not want to draw this here. So what we want to have here is not only the vertices, but we also want to have 
the set values for the values in between and we just do this by interpolating between the set values and we've already seen in the in a lecture about texture mapping how we do linear interpolation between two values and in the next lecture on Thursday we will also talk about an algorithm not only how to do the interpolation but how to do the interpolation efficiently so we will talk about this next time like I said next time we're talking about how to bring color and shades on these objects good so um, yeah, so the set buffer itself or the algorithm for it is really very simple. There is, of course, one thing we have to take care of, and I already talked a little bit about this last time when we talked about the perspective projection, and we said that the set value, the order, it's only important that we preserve the order, but the actual value doesn't really matter. Now, that is, of course, only true if you do not run into precision problems. And uh, that can, of course, happen in practice because the set buffer in graphics, especially in real, when we have games and, and want to do real-time graphics, uh, speed is always an issue, which is, for efficiency reasons, we uh, very often, the set buffer uses not floats, but non-negative integers. So we have values, for example, from 0 to B minus 1. And then we have a set value, and then we have to map each set value to a B value. But that also means, of course, if we have... Uh, that we only have a limited number of values to map to. So if we have the far and the near plane, then of course, um, if this is far, uh, if this is near and this is far, then far minus near is mapped to, and if we have these numbers that we can map it to, then we have, of course, we have to map uh, a size of uh, an interval of mapping uh, is the distance between those two divided by the numbers of values we can map it to. And um, of course, we map the near plane to zero, the far plane to b minus one. But because we do not do a linear mapping, but this mapping to uh, one divided by set, that would be the linear mapping. But we get a different mapping here that, like we said last time, is wider when we're closer to the near plane and smaller when we're further away from the near plane because we have here this uh, function here. So if this is the near plane, then we are closer here. So that means that closer to the eye, we get a higher precision. And if we're further away in the distance, we get a lower precision. So here, it is much more likely that two objects that are very close to each other but still in front of each other are put in mapped to the same set value whereas here even if the objects are very close we are very accurate in the calculation that it is very unlikely that two objects that are very close to each other are mapped to accidentally mapped to the same set value which makes of course sense to have more precision closer to us and less in the distance and uh, also of course it uh, it gives us a way to or, or makes it, illustrates it how important it is to choose the near and the far plane appropriately. For example, you could intuitively say, well, I just put the near plane very close to me, so I make sure that I'm not missing anything that is very close in front of me. But if you don't have any objects that are close in front of you, then you have a very high precision in an area where you actually don't need it because there is no object there. So, because if you think about it, this delta set, if B is because it's modeled inside in bits, of course, is uh, 2 to the power of uh, a value b. So if you want to influence the precision, what you can do is you can modify this b by increasing it. That increases your overall precision. But that is usually a value that is given by, by the hardware or by the graphics API. So you don't have any way to manipulate it. But you can, of course, manipulate it by modifying the near and the far plane. And for example, by making a wise decision not to make the near plane too close, you can improve the precision and the quality of your of your model, uh, of your image, sorry. Good, yeah. All right, so that's, uh, so that's about the, the set buffering now. So we know now how to remove triangles by calling that are not inside of the field thrust, and we know how to do the clipping and we know how to do hidden surface removal, so we know how to draw triangles in the order appropriately, but still 
we talked only about grid models and next time then we will talk a little bit more about shading and texturing which we already did but we will basically finish up the the loose ends uh, to this then uh, next time are there any questions about this no then uh, just a reminder the tutorials also start today again um, please start filling up from room 61 because if everyone fits in there then we will just do it there if not then I will go to to the other room uh, wait 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 not done uh, second thing the uh, practical results they should be online I hope today if not then tomorrow so the grading is basically done but we wait 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 I'm not done the uh, <coughs> We, uh, I want, just want to avoid that I get unnecessary emails, so I have to say this. Uh, we split the grading this time that each TA graded a different exercise because that makes the quality of the grading much, much higher and makes it uh, much better and faster. Um, but it requires, of course, that we put all the stuff together in the end, which is a lot of work and we have to always double check it with 200 students. You can imagine this takes some time. So I hope we have done it today. If not, uh, I'm pretty sure we have it tomorrow. I will also send either today or tomorrow an email to a couple of groups who have a random code check. Like I said, online or in the, in the, in the assignment, we, will, we cannot individually check 200 people. It's just not feasible. But we randomly check like 10 groups or so. We pick them randomly. Um, and then we will invite them to one of the practical sessions next week. Or invite is a little... <laughs> you have to come to one of the practical sessions next week. And uh, then we will, you will basically have to explain us your code and we will talk about it. But those who get the email, I just want to warn you, it is not... A negative sign it doesn't mean that there is anything wrong with your uh, with your uh, submission I really I use a random number generator to to pick the teams so uh, it's really purely random uh, unless of course we we have serious reason for doubt and we also pick some teams uh, but usually it's not the case and also you don't really have to prepare for it we will basically just talk with you about uh, about your code so if you have written your code yourself uh, it should be fine so there is no need to worry all right, any other questions? No? Then we're done. <laughs>